Christchurch Southport. My name's Tubbs. Here to introduce you to our sixth episode of this current series of CCS Online. Now, uh, checking this out for the first time today, then a special warm welcome to you. We are a Church of England congregation at the heart of Southport, with a heart for Southport. Uh, we connect here in a bunch of different ways. Uh, we're about building community, growing together, seeking the power of God to bring hope in relevant ways to today's society. Seeing lives changed with Jesus at the centre. As we move into this episode, I, I want to invite you to take a moment uh, to just set aside this time uh, to be still and to prepare your heart and mind to step further into the presence of God, wherever you might be watching this from. Uh, we'll, we'll have a psalm on the screen and I'd love to encourage you to pray uh, that you would find the faith and hope to hear the Holy Spirit of God speak to you today as we carry on this series. After we've prayed for a bit, uh, we'll head over live to hear this week's message from our Sunday morning in-person gathering, have some music, and before we finish, we'll hear some ways that you can continue to connect with CCS. But before all that, here's a little bit of who we are. Today's reading is taken from Luke's Gospel in chapter 23, starting at verse 32, the crucifixion. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, 
They crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself, if he is God's Messiah, the Chosen One. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Amen. Good morning, everybody. It's great to be with you this morning and to be look, looking at this passage together. If this is your first time here, my name is Ben, I'm the vicar here, and it's lovely to welcome you into Christ Church this morning. Before I speak, let me pray. Father God, I pray that you would give us open hearts and open ears to hear what you wanted to speak to each and every one of us this morning. Amen. So we've been looking at a series at Christchurch over the last couple of weeks, or few weeks even, looking at some of the prayers of Jesus. I think we can probably all assume that Jesus prayed, but there's actually not many records in the Bible of what Jesus actually said, the words that Jesus actually used in his prayers. So we've been looking at some of those times that we know what Jesus actually said. So we heard about when he taught his disciples how to pray. We heard his prayers for all believers. We heard last week that his prayers in the Garden of Gethsemane. And today we hear one of his prayers from the cross. An ancient Roman historian called Cicero described crucifixion as the most cruel and horrifying punishment. For the Roman Empire, crucifixion was one of the ways they controlled and filled people with fear. It was infamous for both the amount of pain and the amount of shame that it would inflict on its victims. Reserved only for non-Roman citizens, crucifixion unleashed the maximum cruelty on the lowest classes of society. Slaves, violent criminals and prisoners of war. It was designed to be a public show so that everyone could see what would happen if you dare go against the Roman Empire. Another Roman historian called Quintilian, which is the most Roman name you could ever come up with, wrote in the decades after Jesus' death, whenever we crucify the guilty, the most crowded roads are chosen, where the most people can see and be moved by this fear. The place called the Skull, where Jesus was crucified, was near a gate to the main route into the city. A busy thoroughfare with streams of people walking by every day. Depending on the flogging that a victim would receive beforehand, crucified people could survive several days on a cross. They could be hung vertically, upside down or in other positions. The crosses could look like X's or they could look like the ones we see in pictures today. The nails could go through hands, arms, feet or maybe even other sensitive body parts. 
The creative cruelty of the soldiers would be the determining factor in how a victim was crucified. The only real rules in crucifixion was, were don't sever an artery and don't damage a major organ because that would lead to a quick death. Instead, death would not come by blood loss but by shock, exhaustion, dehydration, not being able to breathe, heart failure or maybe a combination of all of the above. At the foot of the cross would be a collection of tears, sweat, blood and various bowel movements as the body lost control of itself. The question for the Roman Empire was, what can we come up with that causes the most amount of pain, the greatest embarrassment and fills those that see it and hear about it with the greatest amount of fear? And their answer was crucifixion. In the book of Luke that we heard from today, we don't hear any of those details. We just read, they crucified him there. No specifics, no graphic descriptions, all the horror removed to leave these four haunting words that do not begin to describe what happened. They crucified him there. To an ancient audience who knew of the terror of crucifixion, this wasn't something that you described. The description we do hear in the passage is that the soldiers gambled for Jesus' clothes. You see, people were generally crucified naked. The victim has to endure the shame of spectators poking at their body parts and laughing when they are unable to control their bodily functions. In his crucifixion, Jesus is stripped of his clothes and he is stripped of all dignity. Mocked, abused, tortured, probed, impaled, ridiculed, hated, naked. No clothes, no control, no dignity, no majesty. No wonder a Christian who lived a hundred years after Jesus' death called Justin said this, they say that our madness consists in the fact that we put a crucified man in second place after the unchangeable and eternal God, the creator of the world. It is crazy to believe and say that the Son of God was crucified. The whole world thought that the early Christians were mad to believe this rubbish. Gods don't get humiliated. Gods don't die. Gods don't get crucified. That is what happens to the lowest of humans, not the highest of gods. Yet running through Luke is this irony that Jesus is really king. Today is Palm Sunday, and on, on Palm Sunday we remember that Jesus entered Jerusalem on a donkey and the crowds cheered, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. In the passage today, Jesus is mocked by the soldiers and even a criminal next to him for claiming to be the Messiah. On top of the cross, there's a sign which is the only thing that we know that was written about Jesus during his lifetime. And it says, this is the king of the Jews. It was put there as a joke, to tease him, to make fun of him in this situation. But ironically, it turns into his coronation. It's the place where he becomes king of the world. Jesus is lifted up above the whole world with a sign saying, this is the King of the Jews. This is God the Son, who existed before the world began, who is all-powerful, who at his voice every knee shall bow, who is King over this world. In the crucifixion, Jesus bounds himself to human wretchedness, evil, hatred and cruelty. On the cross, Jesus is not the king that the world was looking for, but he is the king the world needed. He is the suffering king. The king who will always be on the side of those who suffer, 
who lose dignity, who experience pain, who only see darkness, who only know abuse, who only feel hatred. Jesus did not rescue the world through armies or through power. He went to the darkest of humanity and got hurt, got stripped of dignity and died in cruelty. The suffering king is not immune to the pain of this world. The suffering king is not immune to the pain in Southport. The suffering king is not immune to the pain in your life. The cross shows us where God has been present and where God will be present. German theologian Jürgen Moltmann writes this. The God of freedom, the true God, is not recognised by his power and glory in the history of the world, but through his helplessness and his death on the scandal of the cross of Jesus. The hope that Jesus brings is not for the winners or the powerful or the holy. Jesus is the hope of the broken, the ground down, the sinners. On the cross, Jesus joins all of humanity that is broken, ground down and sinful. And he says, I am with you. You do not need to become me because I have become you. If you've come here today and you feel broken, ground down, sinful, if life feels dark for you today, know that Jesus is with you. And as Jesus hangs on the cross, he says this prayer. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. At this point, Jesus is hanging naked upon the cross. Yet he starts his prayer with the word, Father. It's the Greek word, pater, which comes from the Aramaic word, Abba. There are many words I would probably use in Jesus' situation if I was talking to God. In fact, when I was a student in York, I used to cycle around York all the time. And York is quite a windy place, and whenever I cycled, the wind was always in my face. And I addressed God with a lot of very interesting words. None of them were Father. This word Jesus uses points to closeness, dependence, trust. All the suffering Jesus went through didn't change or jeopardise his relationship with God, who he called Father. In the midst of his own pain and in the midst of his own humiliation, on his darkest night, his vision of God does not change. God is still his Father, whom he's close to, who he trusts, who he depends on. I'm going to be honest. I think it's really easy to trust God, to depend on God, to feel close to God on the good days. When everything in life is going right, it's easy to worship God. In fact, I would say that most people, if you won the lottery tomorrow, you'd probably be able to say, God is good. He wants good things for me. I can trust God. God will always provide for me. But the real test is not on the good days, but on the bad days. When the winds of this life are blowing in your face, when you feel broken, when you are hurting, when the world seems dark, can we still turn to God and say, Father? Can we still turn to God and say, God, I trust you. God, I depend on you. God, you are good. Can we worship God in the storm as well as in the calm? Can we trust God even when we hurt? Can we depend on God even when we can't see a way forward? On the cross, Jesus begins his prayer with the word, Father. And he continues, Father, forgive them. These are pretty incredible words for Jesus to utter. The Jewish leaders have set him up. Pilate has washed his hands of justice. 
The Roman soldiers are torturing him. The crowd is laughing at him. The criminal next to him is mocking him. And Jesus asks God to... They've not said sorry. They've not shown any remorse. This isn't in the past. When Jesus says this prayer, they're continuing to humiliate and kill him. Yet Jesus asks God to forgive them. Those responsible for the death of Jesus know what they're doing, but they don't realise what God is doing through Jesus. While people were sinking nails into Jesus, he was sinking blessings upon them. While people were setting Jesus up for death, he was setting them up for life. While Pilate washed his hands of justice, Jesus washed the world with mercy. While the crowd lifted their voices to laugh at Jesus, Jesus lifted his voice to offer forgiveness. While the world offered Jesus hatred, Jesus offered the world love. Jesus asked God to forgive them before anyone at the scene had asked for it or even knew they needed it. Forgiveness did not come after saying sorry, Forgiveness came before. In everyday life, if someone was to hurt you, oftentimes it's difficult to forgive them until they've said sorry or until they've shown any sort of remorse. The wrongdoer is oftentimes the first mover in the process of making things right. With Jesus, forgiveness is offered before people say sorry or show remorse. Jesus is always the first mover in the process of making things right, even though he has done nothing wrong. The foundation of a relationship with God is that he wants us, he forgives us, and he has already made the first move. As Paul puts it in Romans, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners... Christ died for us. Forgiveness is the free gift of God that is offered to this world. It is offered to us whether we realise it or not, whether we want it or not, whether we feel like we deserve it or not, whether we say sorry or not. On the cross, Jesus offers his friendship to those who are killing him. On the cross, Jesus offers his heart to those that stripped him of all his dignity. And Jesus didn't do that simply for those people 2,000 years ago who were involved in his killing. That offer of forgiveness is for everyone, at all times and in all places. That offer of forgiveness is for us today. Yet there's a difference between forgiveness and reconciliation. Forgiveness can happen without reunion. Forgiveness can happen without the distance between us and them being closed. Forgiveness can happen without friendships being restored. Jesus opens the door by offering forgiveness, yet it is our choice whether we go into the house. The barriers have been removed between us and God, but it's our choice whether we want to walk with God. In this passage, we see the criminal hanging beside Jesus, finding his way back to God by saying, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Where you are going, can I go with you? Jesus offers forgiveness to everyone, no matter your past, No matter the mess of your life, no matter the evilness that lies within, yet this offer is the first part. The second is to say to Jesus, where you are going, can I go with you? I don't want to build my own kingdom in this world. I want to live in your kingdom with you as my king. I wonder if you're sitting here today and thinking, God can forgive some things, but what I did or maybe what I'm currently doing, you know, God can't really forgive that. And my response to you is that Jesus offered forgiveness 
to the people that were physically torturing him and killing him while laughing at him. There is nothing you can do that will stop Jesus loving you. There is nothing you can do that Jesus will not forgive you for. This short prayer of Jesus finishes, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. It's almost like Jesus is pleading with the Father. It's not just, Father, forgive them. He also puts some mitigating factors into the prayer. The people that are killing him, he makes excuses for them. He's like a defence lawyer arguing their side before God, yet he's the one being wronged. Jesus is not just with us, Jesus is for us. The criminals that Jesus hangs with, he wasn't just with them, Jesus was for them. When Jesus was born into this world, he was called Emmanuel, God with us. But God was more than just with the world, God was for the world. The astonishing thing about God is that he forgives us and he is on our side. Jesus is in our corner. He is rooting for us. He wants us to do well. He is proud of us. It is ever so easy to see a God who might begrudgingly forgive us, but wants nothing to do with us. Who's maybe this Scrooge-type figure that's always in a little bit of a bad mood and always disappointed in people, looking for any opportunity to get out of people's lives and be distant. That is not who God is. God is for us. God is not looking down at us with a scorecard doing a religious offstead on our lives. God is looking down at us going, you're great. I love you. Keep going. I'm going to always be with you. You don't need to be scared. He's not looking down at us going, you're a failure. You're always a mess. You were a mistake. You had so much potential, but you never really reached it. I wish I didn't have to love you. I wonder which voice is loudest for you. Because if I'm being honest, I sometimes think the first is too good to be true. And I hear the second voice that says, God just puts up with me. On the cross, as Jesus makes excuses for those that are killing him, he shows us that God is not just with us, but that God is for us. And if that sounds too good to be true, don't listen to me. Hear the words that Paul writes in the book of Romans. And it's from the message translation, and I've changed the words us to you to hopefully help you see that this is what God says over you. With God on your side like this, how can you lose? If God didn't hesitate to put everything on the line for you, embracing your condition and exposing himself to the worst by sending his own son, is there anything else he wouldn't gladly and freely do for you. And who would dare tangle with God by messing with one of God's chosen? You. Who would dare even point a finger? The one who died for you, who was raised to life for you, is in the presence of God at this very moment, sticking up for you. Do you think anyone is going to be able to drive a wedge between you and Christ's love for you? There is no way. Not trouble, not hard times, not hatred, not hunger, not homelessness, not bullying threats, not backstabbing, not even the worst sins listed in Scripture. None of this phases you because Jesus loves you. I'm absolutely convinced that nothing, nothing living or dead, angelic or demonic, 
today or tomorrow, high or low, thinkable or unthinkable, absolutely nothing can get between you and God's love because of the way that Jesus, our master, has embraced you. Jesus, the suffering king, loves you, forgives you, and is for you. Let us pray. People hurting, people broken, beaten down and feeling hopeless. Wonder if it's gonna always be this way. Who will speak up for the captive? Show some love and heal a past that finds the wounds we think will never go away. What if we could be a people on our knees as one before the King, cause we believe. All the world starts changing as the church starts praying. Strong will start to break, oh, oh, when we pray. Cause the world starts shaking at the sound of Church starts praying, stronghold starts to break. Oh, oh, when we pray, there's a wall starts shaking, and the sound of praise. Nothing stays the same. Oh, oh, when we pray, all the world starts changing as the church starts praying. Good stuff. 
I, uh, I really hope you've continued to sense God speak to you through our sixth episode of the series. Like always, if you'd like to take this week's message deeper and see it grow and shape your faith even more so, we've got some questions in the description for you to spend some time reflecting on, either on your own or in your personal reflections or, or together with others. Uh, growing together and supporting and challenging one another. And then if anything has spoken to you in this episode, do get in touch either through uh, CCS office or the YouTube comments. And remember, there's a bunch of uh, stuff to get involved with across the CCS family too, if you'd like to stay connected with us. If, if, you, if you'd like to connect with one of our missional communities, blessing our town of Southport, just contact the office. Or if you uh, if you want to keep in uh, keep up to date with all things CCS, you can you can get yourself on our weekly emails, or check out this week's CCS news in the episode description or our social media channels. And on that note, uh, do remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the notification bell to make sure you never miss an episode. And if you do that, then I'll see you again next time. Thanks for joining us. Be blessed and be a blessing to others.